Sounds good. All right. Um, so we're going to um, start the presentation um, or rather the discussion in a minute. Uh, Karen will lead it. Uh, but before we do that, we have two things to uh, cover. One is the antitrust policy. As you know, Hyperledger um, is covered by the Linux Foundation's antitrust policy. So we should not be engaging in any trust busting activities here. Um, that's first. That's the first uh, comment. The other one is, uh, so if anybody disagrees with this, please uh, do not continue to attend the meeting. Uh, the other, other directive that we operate under is the code of conduct, which means that we are going to be uh, civil and kind and respect each other even when we are disagreeing with each other. If we, even if we are disagreeing with one another, of course, when you're agreeing to, you, you gotta be nice. Um, so without much further notice, we, I think we should start because uh, I noticed there are a lot of people on the call. I do not want to uh, going to uh, introducing everybody. As you know, the capital market SIG is concerned with uh, all matters in DLT and in Hyperledger in particular connected to capital markets, which is vast, uh, which is a vast topic. And uh, this month we are going to have a focus on central bank digital currency. Karen wanted to have a discussion on the digital dollar project. I suppose she will do the introduction to that topic and uh, kick off our um, our uh, debate or discussion here. Yep. Thanks, Vivian. Um, so you know, this has been a a topic that we've uh, talked about a little bit on in in this group. You know, Vivian is working on the e taller project with Mani. Um, but we hadn't really discussed this paper yet, and I thought it would be an interesting um, topic to bring up with this community and just see what is everyone's thoughts on, um, on this whole concept. Um, this isn't a formal presentation or anything, just an open discussion. Um, I'm going to put the cart before the horse just a little bit. Um, I, I took the liberty to just summarize the paper in case you haven't had a chance to read it, or um, <clears throat> it's been a couple months since you read it. So I'll get into that in a second, um, just as a way to queue up our discussion. But we have Amy Kim here, who is from the Chamber of Digital Commerce, and um, they have a working group in that, in that community that is actually working on a formal response to uh to the white paper to share their thoughts and their input on the white paper and um, unfortunately amy can't join us for the entire discussion today um and so i wanted to give her the opportunity to talk a little bit about what they're doing at the chamber um what their draft paper consists of right now and just share um share some thoughts on on this topic with us hi amy Hey, Karen, thank you for that. And, and thank you for accommodating th th my scheduling um, overlap. So I appreciate that. And it's really nice to be able to, um, to discuss this with, with this group. Um, so I'm really I'm happy to do it. It's definitely been on the horizon for uh, a lot of us looking at this and the implications of it on the ecosystem. You know, whether you're a, a bank or a tech company or a, a so-called stable coin um, developer or issuer. Um, so we were we anxiously awaited the publication of a digital dollar project. Um, both Chris Giancarlo and David Treat, who are two of the co-leads there, are on our board, um, and so it had a, a number of conversations with them and and had you know listened to them quite a bit on, on what their ideas were. Um, you know, the paper I thought you know 
uh, and I'm curious what folks think, uh, you know, I, I thought it touched on all the right topics that we need to think about uh, and understanding it's a first, you know, it's the first um, description of this, you know, kind of over the transom. Um, you know, what we wanted to do as a group is explore it a in a little more uh, detail. And, and, and so we've decided to offer kind of an open letter that we'll share with the Digital Dollar Project um, that would include our thoughts on that, um, on some of those deeper questions. You know, for example, we have a number of um, banks um, of all sizes, global multinational banks to kind of local um, state chartered banks um, within our membership. And so just how you would utilize or you would incorporate a, a digital dollar into the two-tiered banking system um, does, you know, has raised some questions in our membership, you know, how would that work in certain specific circumstances? Um, so exploring some of those things and, and understanding that this is complex. If we're thinking of completely revisiting how we look at the dollar, um, you know, the, the, the answers aren't going to come right away, um, but we do need to have all the right questions and start to kind of get to them. Um, you know, the other is, it, I'm just going to throw some ideas out there that we're going to explore in our paper. Um, we will talk about the benefits of it, um, how it could facilitate retail, wholesale, international payments. Um, I'm just kind of looking at our outline. Um, you know, and, and we talk about encouraging growth of the um, decentralized finance ecosystem, uh, at using this as a way to maintain the U.S. dollar status as the world reserve currency. Um, things like that. Uh, and then we also talk about, you know, some of the maybe risk factors that need to be considered. For example, the tension between um, AML uh, growth and compliance um, versus, you know, the need for consumers to have privacy um, in their financial information and, and just the data surrounding that. Um, mm -hmm. So we're, we're exploring each of those. Um, and then I, I think too, and this could be a really cool um, conversation topic for this group, but up to you is, you know, how, what kind of, is this a decentralized system right off the bat? You know, how do you, or permissionless, um, and how, how do you think about implementing it um, and in what way? So, you know, those are just some things, I mean, these are big <laughs> topics that, um, you know, you can see right away, you could argue either way, you could argue a couple different prospects. So, sorry, I'll pause there. Um, but happy to take questions or talk about any of those things. And um, when do you anticipate your response being finished? Mm -hmm. So currently we're on track for um, mid-August. Because that's mid-August, you know, it's possible it becomes September. Um, but we wanted, we do have some, some very specific milestones to try to keep this on track because these types of issues, it's very easy to get lost in them and just trying to tackle them, get your arms around all of these. So we're trying to keep it sufficient level of detail, but maybe not too far in, down the rabbit hole. So that's our, that's our timing right now. About a month from now is our, is our current schedule. Okay. Yeah, it might be interesting if we had you come back once it's done and, and shared what's in the paper. In your oh, sure, yeah. And, you know, it con conforms exactly to the principle that was raised um, early, which is co it's collegial. Um, you know, while, while we may have people that agree or disagree with certain things, I mean, this is really an exploration of ideas and really just promotion of the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <clears throat> so this is uh, Manny Pillai from uh, SwapSub. Um, uh, Amy, did we, uh, Vipin and I have been working on an e dollar project and you know we're happy to show a demo of that and also we are you know looking to actually um explore and how to implement using data standards we've just been lacking in, in pretty much every uh, cbdc experiment that's been happening in the marketplace today uh, mm -hmm. and we're more than happy to you know uh, contribute to whatever your, your, your white paper and, and separately we are also working on on similar lines but more on you know how do you tackle uh, uh, technically Right. Well, uh, that would be great. Um, if maybe Karen, if you could connect us, we could have maybe talk offline. On... Yeah, that would be great. So we're more than happy to participate and contribute and also share what we have done and what we are exploring as well. 
Well, and one thing we could discuss um, later on in our call today is also, you know, it, there is a call for feedback at the end of the paper. Um, you know, maybe this group would be interested in putting together uh, something similar uh, from our perspective, perhaps a more technical perspective something to think about during the discussion. So um, thanks so much, Amy, for joining us for the, the, the time that you could. Um, and um, we look forward to having you come on more often and, um, and sharing uh, what your final response ends up being. Yeah, thank you for that. And let's keep in touch, because if you guys do write something, I view this as like a multi-phased development you know uh, so i think what you just suggested sounds like a fantastic idea so love to make sure that we're kind of communicating and you know each in our own way kind of furthering the conversation so mm -hmm. um, really appreciate you uh, inviting me to share thanks so much amy all right thanks everyone stay well okay so kind of um backtracking a little bit uh Again, we've got a mixed group here. So just in case um, you are, haven't, aren't familiar with the paper, I'll just walk through some of the main uh, points in the paper um, as a refresher so that we can have uh, those points in mind as we get into more the discussion part of, of this meeting. So um, in case you're not familiar, the Digital Dollar Project is part of the Digital Dollar Foundation, which was launched in January this year. It's led um, by Chris Giancarlo um, and uh, David Treat from Accenture, as well as Charles Giancarlo as well. Um, you've probably heard them do quite a few speaking engagements on the topic. Um, as, it, as it led up to the release of this white paper. The purpose of the project is to encourage the research and public discussion on the advantages of a digital dollar, bringing the private sector together to discuss these possible models to support the public sector. Um, and the aim of the project is to develop a framework for um, you know, how to establish a central bank digital currency. Well, boss. Can everybody make sure they're on mute, please? So what is the digital, digital dollar project? Um, so the project believes that the U.S. should lead in the effort to tokenize central bank currency, that it is a leader in the global economy um, and should take that position. It incorporates a champion challenger approach that explores um, the thesis of this tokenized dollar, but considers uh, alternatives as well. And this model is defined as operating alongside existing money, so it's not supposed to replace any current um, currency we have, um, that it would be distributed through our tier, two-tiered banking system, um, recorded on a new infrastructure, which is maybe a distribu distributed ledger, but maybe not. Um, the paper does not actually go into detail about that. And it tokenizes the dollar, and this, it, which is differentiated from an account-based system, which we get into later. They anticipate that the main characteristics of a digital dollar would be tokenizing USD, operating alongside fiat as, again, not replacing um, any type of currency we have now, but acting as an additional format. Um, it would respect individual privacy and comply with our regulations. Um, it wouldn't have any impact on the Federal Reserve monetary policy necessarily, but actually act as a, an additional tool of the Federal Reserve. Um, its design would be driven by policy and economic requirements and have an adaptable architecture um, that would future-proof it to any um, policy or technological developments that come later on. And um, it's mentioned quite a few times in the paper that this will catalyze private sector innovation. 
just an image from the paper here to show you how it would operate um, alongside cash and not replace it. So we have our Federal Reserve here, the cash, and the cash that goes to commercial banks and financial intermediaries, um, and digital dollars would follow along that same system. The advantage here comes with digital dollars being more a, a more direct um, way of initiating those payments rather than the, um, the, the system that we have today where there's, it's account-based and signif there's significant reconciliations. So why tokenize the dollar? The paper says um, that the main arguments for this are to drive innovation. Um, this would be a new financial medium on which central bank money can flow not just domestically, but also internationally. The fact that a digital dollar would be programmable, um, both per token or per transaction, which would unlock a lot of new capabilities as well. The fact that it's increasingly portable, um, uh, differentiating itself from cash, um, so this is something that if it were to be developed, it should be able to be sent like a text. It would increase efficiency. So lower costs, diversifying payment rails and allow for more direct monetary relations. Would increase accessibility. So um, uh, allowing for an alternative access to central bank money outside of um, the specific organizations that have uh, accounts with the central bank, such as Fedwire, um, allow for atomic delivery, um, so eliminating that uh, reconciliation process, um, and allow for digital international payments. Um, another reason that is stated is financial inclusion. The question mark is mine, um, because I think that this is, um, you know, uh, 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 this is my own opinion here. Like, there's uh, financial inclusion is often stated as a benefit of digital currencies, um, but I don't know. Um, and this is something we can discuss later on. If 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 it's really the digital aspect that's um, keeping people from having uh, access to bank accounts and such, um, because we have. So it's not necessarily the digital transfer that's keeping people from being included in finance, although it can make it easier. Um, but their argument is it lowers system costs, and so because of those lower system costs, um, banks would be more um, willing, capable to expand their coverage to broader populations um, and into other services. And um, it, it, they were writing this paper just as um, COVID-19 started to take over the world. And, um, and so there's a few parts in the, in the, in the paper that discuss how um, potentially if we had a digital dollar, the distribution of um, COVID relief payments would have been easier. What are the benefits of tokenizing the dollar? Well, um, uh, they contrast this token model with the account model, which is how our system operates now. Um, with the graphic there, uh, you can see how that works. Um, a token model is just a direct transfer. Many of us are familiar with this thing from Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies that we um, all engage with. Um, and the account model instead um, has two parties agree on a transaction, then they have to talk to their bank and the banks have to talk to each other. And so there's just this additional step in process, whereas this is um, a more atomic transaction. Um, so the token contains uh, all the information necessary for a transaction to be verified and complete in one step. Um, and as a uh, sort of aside, DLT can really ensure the uniqueness of this token. That's one advantage of using DLT for tokenization. Um, the account model has all these additional steps. 
You've got this enhanced automation of transactions, a near real time exchange, no matter where the parties are located. Again, we, we know this from, from uh, cryptocurrencies and individual programmability per token or transaction, um, such as controlling anonymity or having interest bearing features, account limits, et cetera. The paper states um, throughout the various benefits of uh, not just tokenization, but a central bank digital currency. So um, it would provide broader access to the US dollar, which it considers a public good. Um, and it considers uh, it a priority to maintain the US dollar as um, uh, the status that it has as a world reserve currency and would allow for the US dollar to continue to maintain that status by modernizing the US dollar. Would reduce operational complexities. Um, think about you know, that account model I just showed or um, the uh, you know, settlement uh, system that we have. Improve cost efficiencies as a result. Um, allow for more transparency and reduce counterparty risk increase the trade liquidity. Um, so by facilitating uh, international payments, um, it could potentially unlock um, enhanced capabilities in trade. Um, money would just flow at the speed of digital, right? Money would be sent like a text, right? Um, and it would enhance not just uh, the national currency, um, but also the global economy. And then finally, at the end, it lists some of the use cases, um, both for domestic payments, so peer-to-peer, -peer, retail, um, international payments, so your remittances or your cross-border payments between uh, institutions, and then um, the government benefits, um, and specifically mentioning those exceptional circumstances like in COVID-19. It doesn't really discuss the downsides or the challenges of a digital dollar, um, which I guess makes sense um, as it's really trying to promote this idea to policymakers. So I think that could be a, a place where we could start potentially in our discussion. Um, and then I wanted to just share here. So they do welcome public feedback. Um, and that's something that we could also discuss as a group if, uh, if a number of us are interested in putting together uh, uh, what we think um, should also be considered, perhaps from you know, um, being in an open source community from a more technological perspective. So that's a quick summary of the paper. Um, any anyone uh, have some initial thoughts or want to contribute to what they got out of the paper before let's say we think about what are sort of the pros and cons of the idea itself maybe a question here it's 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 natalia it's uh, just before going to the benefits or, or downsides of, of using um, the, the, the tokenized dollar. How, um, how is the process? Like this is, this is more an study that it's being prepared, but how do you see the implementation of the, of the tokenized dollar? You say that, uh, what exactly do you mean? Meaning who will uh, take the lead? This, this, foundation, this foundation is only a, a advisory board. They have no real, uh, I mean, they are uh, composed of very influential people, but uh, the Fed has already pushed back a little bit on this uh, during the hearings, which is what I have in, in my uh, link uh, that I have written about it. Uh, you know, two, there were two hearings on the topic. One was about financial inclusion. The other was during a questioning of the Fed uh, chair, there was another uh, question about how much would uh, private 
uh, parties participate in the uh, creation of infrastructure, which seems to be more towards your question, that is, what, who's going to take the lead? The Fed says uh, that they will have to uh, take the lead and control most aspects of the infrastructure. And I would assume that that means including the uh, parts of the wallet. And that's my view because the, uh, the integrity of cash, for example, is preserved by the um, control of every aspect of the production of cash by either directly the central bank or their agents, the US Treasury in, in America. And in most other countries, it, these are all very strictly controlled. You cannot just, I mean, private enterprise, if it's uh, involved, is uh, uh, operating under the guidance of, under the guidance and control of the central bank. So any uh, CBDC effort will have a huge input from the central bank because any hacks on this wallet or any hacks on this CBDC would reflect very poorly on uh, the integrity of the money money itself. That's my view. Thank you, Vipin. Um, yeah, the paper gets, the paper mentioned that there could, that if there would be um, collaboration with the private sector and potentially um, regulated intermediaries for the actual uh, distribution of the tokens. Yeah, that is the two-tier model, which is uh, there in cash too. You can't, I mean, normally you don't go to the central bank to get your cash. You go through the regular, uh, you know, your commercial banks to access cash, which is available to everybody. Um, but uh, the fact remains that the cash is controlled heavily. Uh, anyway, um, if anybody, like, I would like to hear from, I mean, this is me. I would like to hear from uh, people like Stefan who have uh, uh, access to the thought process in uh, ECB, European Central Bank. They also have a, a CBDC project and French government also has a CBDC project. So maybe uh, we can uh, internationalize uh, and also uh, Paolo Rodriguez was great. Uh, you know, insight into this through a public mint, his company. Uh, so, you know, any of these people or, you know, anybody else for that matter, uh, with insight into this uh, before we uh, launch into what Karen's questions are, which is what are the, what are the challenges? Yeah. Um. Hi, it's Stefan. It's more uh, a, a question than a comment, if I may. I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, it's an exciting project, but I'm wondering how does that accommodate uh, anti-money laundering requirements? Because the um, account model, no doubt, has uh, many limitations and is uh, structurally costly, but one of its benefits is that it puts the onus on uh, regulated entities to ensure compliance with uh, anti-money laundering uh, um, uh, rules. And, and how would that apply here, especially uh, if you have direct uh, interactions between um, the sender and receiver of money transfers? I think that's a good question. It's, it's brought up in the paper a few times. Um, and I think privacy would be, is, is a real consideration for a C, CBDC, um, especially if it's a CBDC that is, you know, maybe not using, um, you know, distributed ledger technology or, you know, some things that in, in, in our world are privacy preserving. 
Um, what it says is, it, it says, it, it basically brings up the privacy consideration, but doesn't necessarily offer a recommendation um, that, you know, policymakers uh, would have to essentially figure out where to draw the line on um, AML and KYC. The, the line is already drawn, right? According to the laws that we have today. Who's, who, who's that? Uh, let, let's try to. Hold on a second. Is that Kevin? I'm going to mute Kevin. Okay, I, I muted Kevin. Uh, so anybody else? Ron, uh, looks like you have your hand up. Okay. I, uh, it, go ahead. Go ahead, Paolo. You first. Okay. Um, well, first of all, hi to everyone. Uh, this is really an interesting topic for, for us. Um, um, following what was said before, I think the report is not clearly stating a model or another model exclusively. So there's this token-based approach and the account-based approach. But obviously, uh, the solutions will arise with some hybrid approach, taking the best of both worlds. What I mean is we need to find, or um, technology and regulators need to find a balanced way between privacy on one side and all the AML tools that typically are uh, provided by, by the financial institutions. And Chris Giancarlo already mentioned that before a few times uh, regarding this uh, bubble of privacy that we all live in up to a point where the amount becomes too big in order to a, people, to a person to still uh, be private. So there, there is this balanced approach uh, um, correlated with the risk involved in any financial transaction. Um, that's one, one, one comment that I would like to add. And the other one, I think it's really relating to the hyperledger community and how we could help the whole industry to tackle this issue. Because the report is not really uh, addressing some of the challenges as we already uh, allure to it today. But one of the challenges is really interoperability between different, different uh, jurisdictions. There's different agendas behind each CBDC around the world. There's monetary sovereignty, there's the decline of cash in some regions, there's the resilience of payment systems, different approaches for different CBDCs. If it's retail or wholesale, there's a huge amount of combinations out there. So obviously, uh, along the way, we foresee that uh, several players will be in this space and there will be space for everyone. But the crucial thing behind all of this is to really to, to answer the question, how we tackle interoperability between CBDCs. And that's something that's not mentioned in the report by Chris Giancarlo. I think it's on purpose because it's just try, as, as, as mentioned before, just trying to push the, the, the regulators on a specific topic. But that, that uh, challenge will come, and I think that's where Hyperledger can really step into and help everyone with a standardized approach, or at least with a vision of how that could be tackled. And I pause here for, for a bit, maybe to hear the, uh, the person, please. So Vipin, it's Ron, and, and actually, Paolo, you, you hit the nail on the head where I was going. I think interoperability is, and in full disclosure, uh, Vipin and Karen, we. The Wall Street Blockchain Alliance is also reviewing public commentary and obviously several of our working groups are diving into digital dollar projects. I think Paulo hit the nail on the head around interoperability, which I think is probably one of the biggest challenges. The, the other thing I, I struggle with, and I agree with everyone on the call around AML, this really is an opportunity to evolve what AML KYC looks like and that thought has to be given to it. I don't mean to be all like economist on it, Vipin, but one of the things I struggle with, I'm trying to understand the model of, it's very easy within the paper to say we'll operate alongside fiat. And, I, you know, I'd be interested in everyone's public perspective on this. In a world where central banks are printing money, what does that operating alongside actually mean? What is the, the mechanism by, by which that happens? Because in the tokenized world, are we looking at a premium on tokens? Are we looking at constantly issuing tokens? I just, it'd be nice to see some clarity around that or, or, other people's perspectives on that kind of economic aspect of this. 
Okay, so so far we have one. Uh, Paolo saying that uh, privacy uh, the, that it doesn't make a statement about tokenized versus account actually it does. It says very clearly it prefers the tokenized model. Uh, whether uh, a later statements uh, make it towards hybrid model, that I don't know. Uh, the other uh, questions we can you know we can one is interoperability. Uh, the other one that uh, Ron just raised uh, is uh, the one on how is it going to operate alongside, uh, you know, the other rails that cash and reserve accounts. Um, just by being there, I mean, you know, uh, they, they will have the same uh, opportunity to print uh, CBDC as they, they have <laughs> to print cash or reserve. In fact, it'll be easier. That's my opinion, anyway. Well, as, as, as a side note, as a side note, I think it would be relevant at least to mention to all the participants in, in this call that there is a, an initiative that is going under the radar by the, by the Lithuanian government, which is the, at least they call it the world's first digital collector's coin. And I think this example is quite interesting because it's like a middle step between what we have today and what we can have in a few years once we have all the schemes and all the regulators in place with a full CBDC. So maybe you should check it out, the, the Lithuanian coin initiative for collectors. It, it is an interesting uh, example that might help people uh, segue to this new way of thinking for CBDCs. Um, this is uh, Manny from uh, SwapSub. Uh, to address the interoperability, um, th there are standards, uh, digital standards evolving. Um, you know, uh, is the uh, common domain model for the, for the financial industry is, has been uh, developing these digital standards. Uh, initially, it was focused on derivatives, but now their focus is, has been adding on uh, cash and, and, and you know uh, uh, the utilization of cash. And in fact, um, well, I have been working with them to actually address uh, digital assets uh, into the uh, common domain model, uh, such that this can be very effectively used, uh, whether it is uh, interorg or interbank or even uh, interaction between uh, central banks. So that this is this is the most advanced stand, digital standard we have seen so far, and we continue to push through. And hopefully, we should be able to publish that in the next uh, a couple of months. And who are you working on that with, Money? Uh, it is a uh, it, it is is the CDM that is the uh, organization for mostly swaps and derivatives uh, dealers association, uh, derivatives association. Um, the, the, it, is, it borrows a lot of information from FPMO, which has been the standard from derivatives. Uh, but you know, now that we are pivoting more towards uh, digital assets uh, and also to uh, cover other types of um, uh, digital assets uh, in processing for derivatives, uh, the whole life cycle of uh, digital assets being now worked on, and, and I, you know, uh, I've been contributing to a bit, and also uh, involved within as well in the process. So we, we should get some uh, more clarity and and and, and a more of a standard evolving over the next, uh, I would say, couple of months. So the short answer to interoperability is standard use standards. Um, um, so that we all know what we are talking about when we are talking about something. Um, and can you also uh, and talk about the TTF, the, the other side of the token itself? Yes, uh, which which we have done in um, in the um, Itala project, and these two aspects uh, really struck home to some of the central banks uh, that we have uh, spoken to. So uh, hopefully, we can uh, contribute a similar. Um, thought process to the DDP as well. Um, in terms of the token model versus the account model, um, nowhere have I seen a actual 
solution to sending money as text. Actually, uh, there was a project back in the 80s, early, uh, early 90s, um, by David Chom, which was using blinded signatures, but that project didn't go far um, for doing this kind of thing. But in Bitcoin itself, we know that uh, some notion of identity is required for ownership, which is basically your private, uh, your public key. Uh, and the possession of a public uh, private key being uh, the way to transfer. But exposing a public key and exposing transactions to everybody in the world opens up uh, interesting uh, avenues of de-anonymization. In fact, it is a cottage industry and uh, chain analysis and others have um, uh, created um, solutions just to do that, meaning uh, who is hiding behind that public key and they are uh, actually working with law enforcement all over the world in order to uh, de-anonymize Bitcoin users, even in a token-based uh, network. So token-based by, uh, by um, uh, especially with the AML uh, component thrown in there, uh, by itself does not guarantee uh, anonymity or privacy. Uh, the other thing is they show in the paper this uh, frictionless transfer between peers, but in Bitcoin, for example, it has to be recorded in a ledger, whether it is decentralized, public, or whatever. There has to be another place in which that transaction is recorded. Uh, at least I haven't seen any solution that does not need uh, that kind of a, a central, uh, not central, but you know, a ledger existing elsewhere other than in the phones of the sender and the receiver. So all of these, uh, you know, there is a lot of hand waving going on. So uh, we we want to make clear what is possible versus what is not possible. I mean, it is possible that you can have a peer-to-peer -peer transfer for small amounts, but in the end, it eventually will have to be reconciled in a public ledger or, or a private or a, you know, some kind of a ledger that, uh, that controls, in fact, who owns what. Uh, it cannot exist. Yeah, there's like a sober oversimplification a bit of the token model in the paper. Um, looking yes. Over the challenges uh, with the token model itself. Well, the token model, according to the paper, is okay. So, in the beginning, the token model versus account model is predicated on Bitcoin versus, let's say, Ethereum. Uh, but in both cases, there is a ledger. And uh, uh, it doesn't exist without a ledger. And in the token model, it's further said that you cannot, you have to spend the whole token and then get change. Uh, so the, it's predicated on the UTXO model, you know, your unspent transaction output, which is a whole amount. And so in order to spend it, uh, let's say you have $10 and you want to pay co for coffee, $2, then you have to make the change eight dollars and get it back to yourself but it doesn't mean that you're completely anonymous and nor does it mean that you can just rely on the coffee shop's uh, mobile uh, device and your mobile device because somewhere else when you go to spend that same two dollars somewhere else or the original ten dollars somewhere else it has to be detected as a double spend and stop so the token model by itself does not guarantee this. And in fact, we have seen in the eCorona paper, which uh, Accenture worked with, uh, and they also call for the two-tier uh, token model. And in, in all these cases, in the end, they use some ledger to reconcile the amounts. Uh, Paolo or... Uh, uh, any other uh, person with uh, knowledge of this uh, can talk about whether a 
true peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transaction can be uh, possible without some kind of a reconciliation. Well, if I, if I may add on my side, um, if I have some Bitcoin and I do a totally offline transaction with you, we can even do it without uh, recording, recording it on the ledger simply by providing to you the private key directly uh, on a on a peer to peer approach and and it doesn't interact with the blockchain at all you're simply owning the the private key to to my bitcoin and the ownership was changed and nothing happened on the blockchain there was an example of a company a few years ago and i'm not recalling their name but i might find it other, um, afterwards that they could effectively transact uh, between two mobile phones, Bitcoin, between two different mobile phones. And then afterwards, it, there would be some kind of reconciliation with the, with the main ledger. But I think you're right in the principle that at the end of the day, there's, there needs to be an entity or a group of nodes or a, a whole blockchain network that needs to have the updated uh, ledger. And I, I, I don't think that's bad. If you think about real-time gross settlement systems, between we, banks, we're not saying whether it's bad or good, yeah, but yeah, yeah. we are yeah. we are questioning the premise of the paper, which says that uh, a simple text message-like approach to um, transferring funds on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Yeah, I think it's oversimplifying the, the the idea, and 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 going over a lot of details. I think it's too. Too oversimplified. That's why. That's why. I, that's why I think it's in it, the industry needs to find a, a, an hybrid approach that can give the ability this sense of peer-to-peer, -peer, of true peer-to-peer, -to, -peer to the end user. And in the background, a lot of things are happening, but it's totally totally transparent to the end user, and they might perceive it as a simple text message, but in reality, is not. Well, I mean, the layer two solutions, for example, Lightning and all that does have uh, some of those characteristics, but yeah. it, 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 in the end, uh, it ultimately requires uh, some kind of a lockup of the funds in the, uh, and uh, a, a series of intermediaries which, with enough liquidity between the two participants to stand in between them. So you're Correct. bringing back some kind of a... Um, um, some kind of centralization back into the picture, uh, especially we know these days that uh, the network effects accruing to the intermediaries uh, always create huge uh, enterprises as intermediaries, which has happened in the payment sphere uh, and which has happened in many other uh, places where they claim that, uh, you know, there is decentralization, but actually Ultimately, the network effects uh, work toward uh, leading us back to uh, to bigger, big organizations or enterprises being in charge of these uh, interchanges. Um, anyway, uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I've taken up too much time, so I'm going to just keep quiet for now. Yeah, anyone who hasn't had a chance to speak or share yet, want to offer your thoughts? Hi, uh, it's Junji. Uh, yeah, it's one thing that uh, I was reading the other day about Fed, um, one of uh, their, they completely endorsed for what I understood, right? The uh, study, the assessment of a central bank digital currency, but I think they're very interested in having a, a less drastic approach to evolve the payments infrastructure. So I know that they are working to evolve uh, very old infrastructure to have a more uh, instant payment. And as we see in China, right, uh, it's a digital currency electronic payment, right? So how these things are work hand in hand, uh, maybe on the retail side to uh, allow that interoperability that uh, one of the folks here mentioned. Uh, and also that peer to, uh, not only peer to peer, but also connected to the digital currency. And I think it'll be easier to break down into, 
of course, the retail, digital currency, and also the wholesale, because when we talk about interoperability, when we talk about requirements, they may have completely different solutions. Uh, and I was talking the other day with uh, Manny and Viping. Uh, and I think sometimes when you think about digital currency, not necessarily something that people will see in front of them, that they are actually consuming digital currency, but maybe it's just uh, uh, bringing more speed to liquidity, uh, to settlement, for instance, right? So instead of sa uh, settling like capital markets, uh, stocks, uh, the stocks in, in T plus two will be almost instantaneously uh, through digital currency, but for people who are trading, actually they don't they don't see it, they don't touch it, but all the infrastructure on the on the back will be using it, right? So I think it'll be just easier to break it down uh, and also to add the payments uh, infrastructure together and how different countries are approaching it and how U.S. is also evolving with the payment infrastructure, because I think that would be uh, a very relevant right, for the adoption and evolution of central bank digital currency. Uh, this is a Manny from SwapSub. Um, is there a, a, in the paper discussion more about direct claim by retail? I didn't hear what you said, direct what? Uh, direct claim by retail, that means like how you would handle cash in your, in, in your wallet. Well, how do you do paper cash? No, it didn't go into any detail on that, as far as I can tell. Well, uh, talking about physical cash, I would say that if we're going for a tier two model, things will naturally evolve to a situation where you go to the ATM and you decide if you want to receive physical cash on your hand or you want to receive digital representation of, of cash in your wallet in, on your smartphone. And that would make the bridge to the current uh, mechanisms that interact with physical cash. You, uh, the, the challenge for um, uh, digital tokens, um, uh, you know, coming to your uh, phone in a two-tier two model is now introduces technical challenges of tokens migrating from one network to another network. Uh, that's been a big technical problem. I don't think that is a, you know, a proper solution to it yet. Correct. Yeah, I agree. And that's, that's where I think this group can really make a difference, is really to help the upcoming need to have this interoperability between different silos. When, when I mean silos, it can be China on one side and US on the other side with, a, with two different silos for two different digital currencies. One might be decentralized and the other one might not be. It might be totally centralized. But that doesn't matter. It, it, they need to inter, interoperate between them. Yeah. How? I mean, the, the paper really doesn't doesn't mention at all um, other currencies having CBDCs as well, and and how that would work. It really has a very um, dollar dominant perspective as a world reserve currency. And it almost seems like, well, everyone's just going to use the dollar. Um, so that's, I think, a, a real hole in the paper is that, you know, the, the dollar isn't the only one who's exploring this. And so how would that work? Any other comments? Uh, is, is Hyperledger going to, or this group going to compile a, a response to the digital dollar project as well, a group? That was my next question. So it's totally up to us, really. Um, 
So, uh, you know, Hyperledger is uh, a, a public open source community. So it's whoever um, comes together and decides they want to work on this and want to work on a response. Um, is how that would go about. So is that something that maybe you could press the raise hand uh, icon in the Zoom? Is that um, something that this group would be interested in? It's not something we have to do, right? It's totally optional. Um, we could just very well just debate and discuss and, and, and talk about it. Um, but uh, uh, we could also actually you know, come together, just like the Chamber of Commerce uh, Chamber of Digital Commerce, sorry, um, is doing, and apparently Ron at, and their groups at Wall Street Blockchain Alliance are also doing, and you know, I'm sure there's a number of others. Um, we could also put together a, a sort of response. I think it could be interesting. You know, we are more a uh, technology-based community. Um, Chamber of Digital Commerce is is policy focused. Um, uh, Wall Street Blockchain Lines is very business enterprise focused, just like we are as well. Um, but we come from that more, um, you know, developer technical community. So maybe there's a unique perspective that this SIG could, um, could add in. So, um, yeah, just raise your hand. And um, this is really uh, the beginning of the discussion, right? Just like the paper itself is, is it, the reason there's not a lot of detail in there is there's, it's the beginning of their own proposals um, and exploration of this topic. And this is the beginning of the discussion um, that uh, we've been having on this SIG as well. Um, this conversation also cues up our next um, SIG meeting. We are actually going to have someone from the Bank of England come talk to us. They also released a white paper um, a couple months ago. And so they're gonna talk to us about their perspective. I think that'll be really useful to um, see what someone outside of the US is thinking about this. Um, and so I think it'd be great to have you all on that call as well. And we can continue the discussion there and continue uh, to talk about whether or not we want to work on a response ourselves um, on that call. So to that end, I have uh, captured uh... Uh, many of the questions and comments from the people uh, as point list in the agenda. So you can uh, take a look at that and uh, we can work up a response. It might be better to just do it uh, in a asynchronous fashion, meaning collaborating over email and over the, uh, uh, you know, working on a wiki page or something for that. Uh, yeah, so, I think it's because, you know, not everyone could make this call here now, so it'd be great to ask on the mailing list who else would want to be involved in this. Well, it's not just who else wants to be involved in it. It, it is basically we are going to actually have those questions put up on a separate wiki page, and then people can add to the questions and they can also uh, volunteer to take each each one of those sections and expand on it. Um, and we will uh, present a concise uh, response uh, you know, with, with uh, uh, everybody's contributions. Great. So I'll share uh, the uh, list to the list, all the uh, stuff that we talked about, or most of it, and people can expand on it. And I'll set up a page, wiki page, where we can collaborate. Excellent. Thank you for capturing that. Um, and thanks everyone for your, your input and comments and uh, look forward to having you on the next call as well with the Bank of England. Thank you, everyone.